Chapter 8, The Stars Align The Stars Align A no-man knelt over his pack in the shadow of the large tent behind, his belongings fanned out on the grass beside him as he made room for the supplies that would soon be arriving. The breeze was stiff, a chill to the air hinting at the rains to come flocculent clouds scudding across the sun and sending waves of light and shadow over that rippling grassy plain. It had been a ten day since their battalion had left the order in force, the company of knights, squires and men at arms totaling nearly a hundred and keeping them to the roads as they had made their slow path southeast across Om and finally due south on the main road into Tethur, the way busy with trade between the many settlements that lined it, as well as the laden caravans north. They were to meet members of the Silver Chalice outside Dar Omar, to join their fellow knights in hunting the brigands and giant hordes rumored to be stalking the southern mountains, though a no man was merely glad such a task had them traveling light, their progress frustratingly slow when compared to the ground he was used to covering in his former, much smaller company. And it was not just the time it took to make and break camp each day. Such a large company could not carry with them supplies for more than a few days' travel and, as had happened many times previous to this, that afternoon found them camped on the plains outside the small city of Riyadhaven, while a group of squires fetched the supplies that had been arranged by the city. A no-man let his gaze drift across the lush plain, the green broken here and there by the simple canvas tents of his fellows. This was not the first time he has found himself camped outside the city, his mind suddenly swimming with memories of the tournament three years before, his own order pitted in friendly rivalry against those men of the Silver Chalice and the Champions Vigilant. He has been doing well enough, too, until he had dislocated his shoulder on the third and final day. How cross he had been to have the chance at victory fall from his grasp, Simon had claimed later he had managed to sulk all the way back to Ithkatla. A no man sighed, feeling suddenly very old. Other memories had been giving him no peace of late either. He was very aware they were passing the Wildeth, the edge of that great forest but twenty leagues from the road they traveled and he would often start, awoken by some fellow or a jolt from his horse, to find his gaze fixed westward. Jahara and the others would have arrived at the city by now and he imagined them back with Frithi and Solafane perhaps sitting together in the palace gardens or Fritha's own house. A no man smiled and tried not to wish he were there with them. Ah, a no man, you are here. And a no man glanced up to greet her as Brianna appeared before him, a bundle of heavily quilted linen under her arm. Yes, my lady, may I be of some assistance? She laughed wryly. I hope so. I set to mending my arming jacket an hour ago, but I fear my skills with a needle leave much to be desired, indeed, I just snapped my last one. Could I borrow one of yours? He smiled, recognizing his own failings at the craft and passing her the small leather wallet where was kept his almost untouched sewing kit. My thanks, she nodded, settling on the grass beside him. So. I hear we will reach Dar Omar within another ten day, they say it is a fine city with a well-disciplined, if small, army under the command of the queen and her consort. Yes, I had heard the same, a no man murmured, his eyes drifting westward across the rolling plain. And the order of the Silver Chalice is to send two hundred of their mounted knights to meet with us. Though I wonder how well our horses will serve us if we must take to the mountains. Does something trouble you, a no man? Sorry. He questioned, glancing back to find Brianna watching him and he realized suddenly he had not a clue what she had said. Forgive me, I was just thinking. Her measured look prompted further explanation. I, ah, that is, the young woman Lady Irlina told you of, Fritha, she is currently staying with the elves of Seller. They both turned to gaze west that time, and though impossible, a no man felt he could almost see in the distance that dark wall of trees and the city they knew was hidden behind it. What was she like? 
came the voice next to him. I've a picture, actually, he offered and Brianna waited patiently as he rummaged through his pack to draw out his prayer book, opening the back cover to the square of fine bleached parchment hair Dallas had gifted him before they had parted on that grey morning those many ten day ago. It had been taken from the sketches the bard had made in the Druid Grove, her figure brought out in fine sweeps of charcoal and ink, the girl stood in the river, the waters swell about her calves and curls swept untidily back as she half stooped to rinse the tunic she held, fine face wearing grainy, grey blush. Herr Dallas had pressed it into his hands, reminding him that whatever had happened, there was always hope. A no man did not know if he or even the tiefling had believed that, it was certainly difficult to imagine when he had glanced up into hollow eyes of the girl stood across from them, but it had been kind of the tiefling and a no man had appreciated the gesture all the same. Brianna was gazing down at the picture, her look unreadable, though she smiled as she handed it back to him. She is fair. A no man nodded, resignedly placing it back between the pages once more. Yes. Though this picture does not really do her justice, or, at least, it would not have done. Much of her beauty came from within and now. It has gone. Brianna finished for him. It has changed. She suffered much in our travels together and though we won through in the end, the damage had already been done. The young woman I left in Suldana Cellar is not the same one whom I met in Ithkatla in those fading days of summer last year. You must miss her. I do, he said simply, I almost had the feeling she did not wish me to leave Suldana Cellar in the end, though perhaps that was just misplaced hope on my part. Brianna was frowning, a no man surprised to find her hand upon his arm in her sudden sincerity. All people can heal, a no man, with time and care, from what I have heard of your adventures, she is a strong person, it may take time but she will become the woman she needs to be. A no man tried a smile. Maybe you are right. At the moment, I am merely glad she is resting in Suldana Cellar and away from these troubles. Perhaps after our campaign here is completed, I will be given leave to go and visit her. Or perhaps not. I would not wish to make things worse. Just wait and see, offered Brianna wisely, who knows what the fates will bring. I do not know about the fates, came a familiar voice, Simon rounding the edge of the tent, Eric at his side, but I wish those squires would hurry up with our supplies, I don't think I can stomach another of meal of pottage and hard tack. A no man glanced back to the cheerful red brick sprawl behind them. I wonder how wise it was to send such a large group, sometimes the greater number of men merely make matters more difficult to organize. Simon gave a disgruntled sniff. Well, I offered to attend with them, but Sir Elquist was quick to remind me such tasks are no longer my concern, after all, we knights have a certain dignity we must preserve above the common soldiery. Eric was frowning at this less than favorable account of their leader, but a no man could speak no words in his defense. Sir Elquist was an experienced commander, who was drawing close to forty winters, his dark hair just graying at the temples, while keen deep-set eyes seemed to take in, and judge, all they fell upon, the man carrying himself with the stern, unflustered air of one who had seen everything before. A no man had already felt the clout of his judgment but days before, an opinion offered on the best place to make camp for the night, rebuked with the comment that, for a knight who had yet before campaigned with his brothers, he would perhaps find it more beneficial to observe and reflect on others' decisions rather than offer up his own thoughts. Brianna, though, was ready with an opposition. Come, Simon, I am sure Sir Elquist did not mean it so. Perhaps he believes the squires need to feel they are trusted for such tasks. Simon shrugged, though the sly look to his eyes gave him away. Perhaps so. I notice he certainly trusts you about a cooking pot, you are on Rhoda to cook again tonight, I see. I am? That is the last five nights. 
A nomen hid his smile, Brianna's flushed indignation at this blatant chauvinism pleasing to see, though he did not have long to enjoy it before she gathered herself enough to demur, if that is what I am to be tasked to, I will not question it. Eric was, as ever, diplomatic. Perhaps he feels such tasks are better suited to you. Indeed, she agreed crisply, we Tormites are well known for our skills in the kitchen. Brianna sighed, resigned to her fate as she reiterated, orders are orders, I will not question them. A good attitude to have, barked a deep voice, their company instantly on their feet and at attention as Knight Commander Elquist stalked from around the tent, two squires hurrying in his wake. There are many here who would do well to follow your example. He continued, his eyes lingering for a moment on Simon. Sir Eric, Sir Simon, the squires are arrived back from the city, go and organize the distribution of the supplies among the men for travel tomorrow. We will need more water and firewood before dark, as well, Lady Brianna, go with them and take a few of the lads to help you. Sir Inomen, you are joint watch commander tonight with Sir Codrell, you can decide the rota of guards between you. Elquist did not wait for their salutes, their small group disbanding and a no man watched him go, marching west across the camp, scarlet tunic bold against the pale green plain. Imoen stumbled, the passing man nearly taking the pack from her shoulder as he jostled past, Valigar catching her arm to right her as the guards behind kept up their constant call above the chaos of people moving both ways through that huge gateway, the polished iron doors thrown open on the plains before it. It was the twelfth day of Myrtol, the sun peaked and beginning now its slow descent in the west, and they had finally arrived. Sarah Dush Move along, move along there, keep the gates clear. Almost a ten day had passed since their small group had left the forests of Seldeneseller, hiking eastwards through the Wildeth to intersect the main road south and make the rest of their journey to that city. And aptly named the place was, too, that sprawl of houses, shops and temples all built around a large stone fortress, its many towers and domes stretching up to the cloudless blue sky, a hub around which the rest of the city turned and even the guards' towers that were set in intervals about the looming city walls were each capped with a copper-domed minaret, from a distance the city had sparkled like a jewel. Imoen smiled, feeling the sudden free zone through her as she stood, at last, in that bustling city, the city of a hundred spires. A cart came rumbling past, Imoen shifting quickly out its path and dancing up onto the narrow pavement, Valigara stepped behind her the area about the gates a hive of people, and Imoen wondered if even Baldur's Gate could compare with such activity. Rows of stalls lined either side of the walls, carts and caravans being laden and unloaded by scores of sweating laborers, that small square bordered by houses and shops, streets and narrow lanes stretching in all directions and teeming with people as they bustled off into the city. Up ahead, Jahara was watching the bustle with a distinct frown. Minsk at her side and wiping the sweat from his brow, the close air just aching for rain. The druid had brought them to a halt before the wide steps of the local shrine to Joaquin, caravan masters rubbing shoulders with merchants as they threw their coin to chime in the large brass dish and chanted a quick prayer to the Golden Lady. Jahara sent them a critical look, before returning her frown to the crowds before them. Ugh, even the main gates of Athkatla were not as this. I have never seen so many people crammed so unnaturally into one space. Come on, Jahara, laughed Imoen, cheer up, you're from round here, aren't you? I am from Tether, the druid corrected, not from here. I grew up in a small wood far to the west of Saradush, and glad I am of it, now I see the place. She added glowering at a group of men who had slowed their pace to watch them as they passed. Imoen shrugged mentally, turning her attention to the man next to her. You all right there, Minsk? Ah, the air and the people, who feels as though this whole city is pressing in about us. Yeah, it is a bit hot, isn't it? 
she sighed, moving a hand to her forehead and surprised to find it damp. We'll find somewhere nice to sit and have a drink soon. We need to get rooms first, said Jahara firmly, Valigar nodding as he scanned about them. There is likely an inn nearby this close to the gates. And then off to the marketplace, announced Imoen blithely, offering to their frowns. Well, that's the first place I'd go, if I'd come here, Fritha and me both love looking at all the trinkets. Valigar quirked a smile. But Fritha has not your talents in that respect, she would have to trade coin for her acquisitions. Imoen glanced to him, unusually serious. I don't steal, Valigar. The man's cheek darkened with a blush, though no other noticed it, Jahara eyeing the tall building across the street. That place looks likely enough, wait here. And off she went, Minsk taking up his duty as guard as he departed with her. Valigar turned instantly to the girl at his side. Before, I did not mean. I know you didn't, Imoen interrupted mildly, don't worry about it, I just don't steal from people. Though it took me a little while to learn it, I came to the understanding it isn't fair taking coin they had rightfully earned, or worse still, their belongings. A ring might mean a couple of gold to the thief fencing it, to the woman he nicked it from, it could have been all she had left of her dead husband or I don't know. People's things mean more to them than the coin they cost. Valigar was watching her with an unreadable look. You have an honest heart, Imoen. Imoen just laughed weakly, maybe it was the heat but she was starting to feel a bit giddy. Yeah, well, as I said, it took a bit of coaxing from my old thief master. I was seventeen and just coming into my own back in Candle Keep enjoying the thrill of sneaking about and going where I shouldn't. Now, Steen had always stressed to me that the skills I was being taught were to be used only in certain ways, but I was finding myself alone in people's rooms at the inn or their chambers about the keep, my eyes catching on a green stone pendant here or a coral paper weight there, and I found myself thinking what was the harm? They could have just lost it, and it didn't seem fair others having such nice things when I didn't, oh. I get all hot in the face just thinking on it. She laughed sheepishly. Steen obviously found out soon enough, though I didn't realize it at first, only things began to go missing from my room. Not big things, but the camisole Fritha had embroidered for me, or the shells I had collected on one of our rare trips to the beach, or my old toy octopus, stuff you couldn't have got two coppers for, but meant the world to me, and I began to understand. I went to Steen. Told him I was sorry, swapped my things for what I had taken and haven't done it since. The last thing stole, properly stole. She added quickly, not something I, you know, planned to give back later, was a telescope. Me and Fritha nicked it from the Temple of Gond in the gate. Valigar's stoicism was having a bit of trouble with that, apparently. You stole from a temple. Imoen snorted. What do you care? It's not like you hold those they're built for in any reverence. Any luck? She called out at the other's return, Minsk glumly shaking his head as Jahara offered tersely, No, it is an inn, but they've no rooms spare. Not one! exclaimed Imoen, Is there like some big Saradush festival we don't know about coming up? Valigar frowned. Perhaps we should ask one of the Mercha, watch yourself. He snapped as a passerby collided roughly with his shoulder. The man turned back, perhaps to shout a reply, though he caught sight of Valigar and thought better of it, the man hurrying on his way grumbling to himself. Minsk watched him go with a frown. Who does not understand the anger here, it seeps in the very air. Neither do I. But I'm going to, said Imoen, the girl already off, weaving across the street to the few stalls that lined the gateway, a stooped old merchant watching their approach with keen, black eyes. Here, mate, what's with all the people? 
Is there some festival going on or something? Ha, huh, I wish, he snorted bitterly, it's the ball spawn, in it, a hundred came with her and more arrive every day. Her, repeated Imoen, and for one wild instant she wondered if he meant Fritha. I, her, the man sneered, that do-gooder, Melison, by, if she was here I'd give her a piece of my mind, bringing this curse upon the city, you mark my words, she'll have doomed us all, her and those ball-spawned wretches. Hey, the children are just people, cried Imoen, they can come here if they want. The beady eyes narrowed. Here, you're one of them, ain't you? I, look at you all, freakish band. Away from me, I want no share in your curse. He waved them off angrily, shuffling back behind his stall as though it would afford him some protection. Ah, yelled at by old press, how that takes me back. And Imoen turned with the others to see him a few paces along the street, a tall, pale lad who was leaning casually against one of the iron lampposts, his freckled face bearing a friendly smile, hazel eyes twinkling from beneath a wild crop of dark red hair. Don't worry about him, he continued, with a nod to the scowling merchant, see it as a rite of passage, for you aren't the first, or likely the last. Hello, I'm Agwin. Imoen shot one last glare at the old merchant, before taking the hand the lad had offered. I'm Imoen, this is Minsk, Jahara and Vals. Valigar. But, aren't you frightened to be talking to us cursed ones? The lad just laughed. Nah, why should I be? I'm one, two, and I know all of you ain't of the children just. He paused letting a finger hover playfully over their company before snapping it to her, you. Imoen was mildly taken aback. How do you know that? Agwin beamed, looking rather pleased with himself. I can see your auras, it's my own little talent as gifted by the blood. Oh, yeah? What color's mine? As pink as your hair. He offered with a grin, Imoen still laughing as he admitted, just joking, it's golden, like a halo. All the children's are very pretty and it never changes either, with mood and the like. One of the nicer aspects of the curse, at least for those that can see it. Anyways, I heard Prez telling you about Melison. Yes, confirmed Jahara, he said she brought you all here. That she did, though many of the locals aren't too pleased about it, as you have just witnessed. Minsk was frowning. Who wonders then, why the leaders here let you all enter? Agwin nodded wisely. Ah, well, Melison did not come to the table empty-handed. The whole of Tether is in fear of these roaming brigands and for those cities like Saradush, who have barely more than a watch to keep the peace, the worries run high. Melison has the loyalty of a half-orc general named Gromnir, one of the children like us, who commands a band of orcs and half-orcs and he has agreed to protect the city should we come under attack, in return for letting all who follow Melison stay here. But why did she wish to bring you here to begin with? Questioned Jahara. The lad shrugged as though he felt it obvious. Protection. Many don't like the children. They see us as cursed and ones to bring ruin wherever we go. Scattered, we can be hunted down one by one, by others of our kind or just people who take a dislike to us. I was the same, forced out of the village where I had lived my whole life after a group of paladins came through and one was good enough to mention the heritage even I was unaware of to the village elders, but then Melison took me in. Lots of people round here think she's just some do-gooder who has taken up this cause not worth fighting. But Melison is wiser than most, she can see that for all people's desire to see Toriel rid of our kind, the death of every Ballspawn brings Ball one step closer to his rebirth. Melison has made it her quest to protect the children and thereby prevent Ball's return, and many have flocked to her because of it. 
But since you're asking me all this, I can assume you aren't here for the same reason. Valigar was nodding slowly. No, we are looking for our companion. Yeah, her name's Fritha, she's one of the children, too, and we think she might have come here, possibly with a dark elf warrior called Solafane. Perhaps Melison knows of them. Indeed, agreed Jahara. I, for one, would be interested in meeting the lady where can we find her? Agwin shrugged again. I couldn't say, she moves about a lot, but I'll let her know you're looking for her, maybe she'll find you. Until then, you need a guide? I know of a nice inn in the eastern quarter and it doesn't mind our sword either. Imoan turned to the others, Jahara's nod as much enthusiasm she was going to get from them. Sure, why not? Good, then, he smiled, linking an arm through hers as they set off, so where are you from? Bear Ghost, Imoan answered promptly in the lie that had served her well in the past, Candlekeep tended to raise eyebrows. Agwin grinned. Really, and are all the women of Bear Ghost as pretty as you? Oh I, more so even. I had to come to Saradush just to get a look in. He laughed loudly, Imoan rather liking the feeling and the bustle about her, warmed by the idea Fritha could be somewhere else in that city enjoying the same. Agwin stayed with them the whole day, he and Imoan full of talk and laughter as he had shown them about the city showing them the various sites that might have tempted their friend, the Grand Temple to Joaquin, the verdant public gardens and the tall stone library that rose among the rich noble houses that ringed the fortress in the finest area of the city. He had spoke a bit of his life, too, as they had went, the lad most animate when he talked of his saviour, Melison, the woman seemingly viewed as a saint by more of the children than just he. From his tales of her she certainly seemed a kind, righteous woman, and to an extent that made Jahara wary, good or bad, she had always been cautious of either extreme. But it was not in the nobles' ward that they were to find their lodgings, the lad leading them through the warren of the slums quarter, where the dry clay streets covered everything in a fine red dust, and over finally to the eastern quarter, the center of the city's artisans and home to the playhouse. It was a once opulent district with a slightly run-down feel, though it was not without its charms, or bustling marketplace that dealt in cloth, jewelry and other cheap trinkets that pleased the eye, Agwin showing them to the inn as he had promised before finally taking his leave. They were at the inn now, enjoying a drink in the quiet tavern, the dishes from their meal long since cleared away. It had been a pleasant enough day once she had again grown accustomed to the jarring pace of city life her months of respite in Suldanacellar and then travelling Om and Tether both allowing her intolerance to return full force against that unnatural press of city life. Jahara drew a sip of the sour wine she was nursing, her eyes falling on the man opposite, Valigar's stern face and muscled neck like polished teak in the lamplight, teeth flashing white as he treated the tavern to a rare smile. He had certainly seemed happier since Agwin had left, for all the lad's charisma. The man now sat on the other side of that square table with Imoen, the girl entertaining them all as she tried and failed to show them a card trick Herr Dallas had taught her. So, you put your card back in, Minsk, without showing me, and I shuffle the deck end. The Queen of Wands landed on the table between them with Pat, is this your card? The Rashami frowned. No. A burst of laughter from her audience, Imoan flushing pink and giggling in her embarrassment. Right, right, hang on then, is this your card? No. Right, well, just a moment. Just say yes, Minsk, laughed Jahara, she'll have gone through the entire deck soon. Oh, fine then, the girl sighed scooping up the remaining cards and finally admitting defeat, I can see this is on a hiding to nowhere, will you pass me the card wallet, Vals? He reached across for it, 
hand closing about the small leather case to reveal the Jack of Swords lain innocently underneath. My card! cried Minsk, Imoen glowing in her triumph. I knew you lot would have no trouble believing I'd mess it up. Valigar smiled diplomatically. I will never doubt you again, Imoen. Yes, well, just you see you don't, she agreed with a playful flick of her hair. When it comes to sleight of hand, at least. And perhaps we can have a slight less hand waving, said Jahara, catching the cup as it teetered threateningly, before Valigar's drink ends up in his lap. Imoen giggled hands obediently back and idly shuffling the deck as she spoke. Ah, I can't wait to show that trick to Fritha, and Agwin, too, he said he'd drop by tomorrow to see how we're getting on. Valigar's face was a stern mask once more. I do not trust him. He seemed nice enough to me, offered Imoen mildly. The ranger snorted. You would say that of any man who complimented your hair. Well, russet and pink do sort of look nice together, don't you think? Valigar rewarded her cheek with a slight smile, the man gamely accepting her offer to show him the secrets of her card trick. Jahara went back to her drink, leaving them to their game. It had been a long while since she had been in Tether the land of her birth holding many memories for her and the nostalgia brought the usual melancholy, it was in Zazaspur to the west where she first met Khalid, they had married a year later under the budding trees of the Ozif forest, the grove where she had come to age with her druid guardians. Perhaps, once they had located Fritha, she could return there, if only to visit the place. You seemed pensive, good Jahara, this city finds you ill at ease. Jahara turned to reassure the man next to her with a smile. No, no, Minsk, I am fine. This land then? I know they do not welcome your kind. He was referring, of course, to her affiliations with the Harpers, Tathiran's disliked meddling of any sort, be it for their benefit or otherwise. The woman shrugged. Not for that but homecomings always bring both joy and sorrow, it is their way. Minsk was nodding gravely. This I know well, though I wonder now if I will ever again feel either. I walked this path with you all back to the elves telling all it was to see young Fritha safe, but in my heart. A war rages there, to return to my home is to face a judgment that I no longer believe is fair, but if I return then the witch Lairon must try me and find me guilty, it is our law. I would live as a free man, fighting evil and doing good in this land, and it is this desire that exiles me. Come, Minsk, you cannot say how the witch Lairon will judge. I know you believe you must return alone, but we will find Fritha and then perhaps we can all make the journey to Rashomon together. Go and stand trial, we will speak for you and if they still find you guilty, then we will leave, but at least we will have tried. Minsk just drew a mouthful of ale and sighed deeply. Perhaps, perhaps. His eyes drifted to the pair opposite them, Valigar attempting to ease a card under his sleeve as Imoen giggled and coached. He is a good man. Jahara smiled wryly. So, who approves this match? He would, but we wonder if such is yet even to grow, they are very different and spring does not lie well with autumn. Ah, forgive me, good Jahara. The Rashami sighed, seemingly frustrated with his own ill humor. The day has been long and hot, and I am tired, I will retire now. And he left her at the table, Jahara turning to watching those opposite, the man wearing that same measured smile as Imoen laughed and joked and tried to coax him from behind that mask. The dawn was breaking, the sky a milky grey with light from a sun. She would not be awake to see rise above the horizon, the plain outside that small copse drained of colour in the half-light, 
a bleak place where small sinners might wander in their eternal rest. Fritha shrugged mentally and went back to her work, lifting the fallen branch and shaking from it the few wood lice who had made it their home before throwing it to land on the growing pile between them, Solafane crouched and harvesting a few of the ferns that were growing up the bank behind them, the pair collecting the brush they would use to hide their small camp. The elves seemed to realize they would attract much unwanted attention in Tether, any warband, however peaceable, sure to cause concern, if not trouble. And so they had kept their traveling to the wilder places and sometimes, to Solafane's relief, at night, as well, one such night of traveling finding them making camp that morning on the edge of the small copse that had sprung in the shallow dip between two hills likely left there by some long melted glacier, Fritha more than ready to sleep the day away. But even for their less direct route across Tether, they were making good progress. They had crossed the river Ith some time last night and they would likely reach the mountains in the next few days, Fernil leading them unfailing towards the peaks that still lay beyond the southern horizon. Fritha actually thought any brigands in the area would be more likely to make camp in the forests of Mir, which curved around the foothills of the marching mountains' eastern peaks, but she could hardly see the point of suggesting such to the captain when he would ignore her anyway, the man's hatred of both her and Solafane unchanged and quite habitual after so long. She glanced to her friend, Solafane still busy gathering the broad ferns. He had been watching her more closely of late, as though worried she would black out again at any moment, and to be fair, she could. Dismissed as mere vertigo before the elves, she had confided to him alone of the dream later on that same night in the sheltered darkness of their tent, though even now she still was not sure whether it had been real or not. The essence was seemingly suppressed again now her soul was returned, but how deep had it really gone? She certainly would not have put her subconscious past conjuring images of a repentant Saravak to manipulate her, especially since what had happened when it had tried presenting Gorion the last time. Fritha stooped again to cut a small sapling off at the base with but a touch of her hand, the girl knocking a few of the thin branches from it as though she wielded an unseen blade. Her magic was growing, her powers finding new outlets each day, another gift of the essence? She was not sure. Do you imagine that's enough? She asked, throwing the sapling onto the pile, though Solafane did not answer and she turned back to find him straightened the knife motionless in his hand as he watched the small brown bird that was perched high above them and singing out its heart to the dawn. He glanced back to catch her watching and they shared a smile. It takes such joy in the dawn. No creature in the underdark would ever dare to be so loud. Fritha laughed, crouching again as she made to gather their harvest of bracken. You will soon wish it were the same here once they all start. It is a sparrow, I think. She continued, peering up at the tiny creature, or perhaps a dunnock. I learned all my birds from books, so I'd have to see it fly to be sure. Solafane sighed and moved to help her. You know so much of the land around you, I doubt I will ever learn it all. No, not really, this is just something any farmer or herdsman would know. Besides, I could be wrong. Jahara could tell you from just its song. She'd tut and shake her head, really, Fritha, kindly do not disadvantage Solafane with your ignorance. You are wrong on both counts, it is a seagull. Solafane laughed, the sound enough to startle their feathered troubadour, the man's eyes soft as he confirmed, you miss them. Fritha shrugged. They both knew it was so her mind suddenly back in that leafy city, the guilt stirring in her stomach. They could have arrived and sold in a cellar by now. I hope they are not worried for me. But do you miss them? And the other friends you made in Lydral and the priestess demon and the others? Solafane gave a wry snort. Friends, you surfacers give that title out so readily, and with seemingly little to distinguish between those you would spend time with to those for whom you would die. Friendships are rare among the drow, though the concept is not completely strange to us, there were people you could trust, at least, to a certain extent, 
After all, it is hard to fight as a unit if the commander has to be as wary of his own men as the enemy they face. But it is a rare thing, and you would not expect to have more than one or two in a lifetime, before the inevitable betrayal. Is that what you expect here, too, the inevitable betrayal? Solifane frowned and shook his head. No and they were all my friends in your sense of the word, in mine, there is just you. Fritha smiled weakly. Good, because when the others find out what I've done, I suspect you will be the only friend I have left. They will understand, he assured her. Fritha said nothing. Their arms full, they returned to their huddled camp, the trees of the copse too dense to allow for their tents and they had pitched them on the edge where the roots finally gave way to soft earth, their pair and the few elves who had not already retired spending a moment to cover those canvas peaks in the brush they had collected. Fritha sighed, dropping to sit about what would have been their fire pit had they dared to light one, the couple, Jastrin and Vesela settling opposite ready to take the first watch as Solafane took the space next to her, the man throwing his cloak about them both as she lay a companionable head upon his shoulder, Tandeth, Bryn, and Avalar settling about them, as well, clearly in no rush for their beds either. Come, sighed the old priest, let us share a cup before we take our rest. Will you oblige us, child? He gestured to the pot of water young Bryn had fetched from a nearby brook, Fritha glancing to those about her, for a moment uncertain. All knew of her powers, indeed half the wieldeth had likely heard it when Fernil had bawled her stupid the first, and last, time she had dared to help and set their water boiling with her fell magics. Poor Bryn had been dispatched to fetch another pot which had not the taint of darkness, though he had confided to her later he did not mind. Tradition of their city always had the youngest as the water carrier, elves linked to nature placing great importance on that life-giving liquid, and he took great honor from his duties. But, back at their camp, Avalar was still smiling mildly and she saw no censure from the others. A blink and steam enriched the air between them in a warm wet cloud. There, nodded Avalar, fetch out the leaves, Bryn, do you have the cups? Tandeth. And so the tea was brewed and shared out with the last of the cheese she had bought from Redm's store, the woody tea and sharp cheese making for a pleasant breakfast, or dinner depending on how you looked at the thing, Tandeth producing a talus deck for a round of what the elves called fork tongue and Fritha knew as cheat, the cards all dealt and everyone vying to rid themselves of their hand, by both truth and falsehood. As ever, the youngest played the first. Bryn tossing two cards into the center with a nervous smile. Two queens. So when will we arrive at the mountains? Tandeth shrugged. Another five to seven days depending on our pace. Two threes. Cheat, said Solafane, Tandeth chuckling wryly as he gathered up the discarded cards and added them to his own. Well. We will have to return to civilization before then, offered Fritha. I doubt we will be able to find the encampment without help. Three fours. Two eights, said Solafane. Two sevens, said Vesela. And then there is the journey back still to face, said Bryn dejectedly. You sound homesick, young Bryn, smiled Jastrin. And I do not blame you, I miss the city too. Three sixes. Cheat, said Avalar, the group laughing as Jastrin showed him the three sixes he had dropped and the old priest's hand increased considerably. Ah, let us see now, four sixes, since I've enough of them. Bryn sighed. Two twos. I wonder if the vines in the open gardens are blooming yet. And we will not be returned in time for the festival of the star fall, added Tandeth, three nines. Two fours, said Fritha, Solafane letting his cards pat on top of hers, two fives. Do you miss the Underdark? asked Bryn suddenly, 
the drow so caught out it took him a moment to answer. Yes, in a way. There is a deadly beauty there for those who can see through the darkness, the treasures of nature just as abundant as in your world for the ones who learned how to find them. A reflective silence broken only by the pad of cards and murmured offerings, Avalar taking his own turn with a sigh. Two kings. And you, Fritha, do you miss you were from Ithkatla, were you not? I had heard it was Baldur's Gate, offered Bryn, two fours. Tandith was frowning. Three jacks, was it not Bergost? Fritha was laughing softly. No, no, I was raised in the library of Candlekeep, and yes, I miss it very much, all the more as time goes on. It was my home for a long while, though I have not been there in over a year now. You could return though, could you not? Pressed Bryn eagerly, as though he hoped to lessen the melancholy of it. I heard if you had a book of enough value they allow you entrance. I am sure the queen would gift you with one. Fritha smiled faintly, taking a sip of tea and finally her turn, the cup hiding that sleight of hand. Perhaps, though I think the way things are now, I could pitch up with another scroll under my arm and still be turned away at the gate. Three sevens. Three tens, said Sola Fane, Vazela throwing down her own pair. Two aces. Two sevens, continued her husband glumly, well, I, where are you going, Fritha? The group looked up as she stood to dust off her trousers, eyes glancing from her empty hands to the now well-stacked pile between them and laughter erupted over their small band. Cheat! cried Bryn, Avalar laughing. It's too late now, lad, we played on. Vazela was searching through the hand she had discarded. She put them all down? And we did not notice. Three sevens, laughed Jastrin, there wasn't even one in your hand. Fritha just smiled, turning to make for her tent. Sleep well, you lot. Immo inside, the bustle about her, which had once been so interesting, now just another mundane afternoon sat on the edge of the eastern quarter's market square. The three avenues of stalls all ringed about the huge central fountain and its statue to Millel, people browsing and haggling with more energy than she could have mustered under that hot, glaring sun. She herself was above the crowds, sat high on the wall where a fine stone terrace elevated houses and shops that bordered the city walls, the theatre opposite rising like a miniature amphitheatre, the bright canopies all drawn out to their fullest to shade the audience within a few of the actors taking a break on the steps and shouting to people as they passed, trying to entice them inside for the next performance. Imoan gave up on her waiting, bored and hot as she sought the cool peace of the alley behind her, the girl watching as merchants and those wealthy enough to have a house up there sauntered past, all loose robes and parasols. She was supposedly awaiting Minsk and Jahara as the pair paid a visit to the local watch post to ask after Fritha she and Valigar going to sit in their usual spot on the edge of the marketplace, though she did not know why they even bothered. Horrible though it was even to consider it, she had the burgeoning feeling that Fritha simply was not there. Valigar was nowhere to be seen either, at the moment, the ranger had muttered something about leather oil and left her soon after the others. Imoan wrapped her arms about herself, almost cold in her thin tunic now she was in the shade, and she turned, moving down the alley and heading for the narrow avenue that had been left between the houses and the city walls, the girl planning to walk along to the steps up and watch for Valigar's return from an even loftier perch. Two days they had been there in Saradush, speaking to priests, merchants and guards all in a vain search for the friend she had once been so sure she would find within those walls, and Imoan had soon grown tired of that city where strangers were held in fear, or worse, utter contempt. She felt her fingers reach up to play with the blue stone pendant Airy had long ago gifted to her, 
letting her mind wander to the planes and what her friends could be doing right at that moment, Imoen felt she could bet that whatever it was, they weren't having as rubbish a time as she. Well, what have we here? Drawled a cold voice and Imoen knew she could happily raise the stakes on that bet as she turned to see three men, unshaven and bearing the red dust of the slums quarter, crowded in the lane behind her. Why, lads, I think we might have found ourselves a ball spawn. Funny, sneered the shortest one, she doesn't look so tough. Imoen snorted. Yeah? Well, you won't say that when I'm wearing your head as a hat, in fact, you won't be saying much at all. Their leader just laughed though. Big words for a little girl, but I wonder who the militia will side with, if this gets bloody, but give us that necklace and whatever else is in your purse and perhaps we can avoid any unpleasantness. Ha, huh, that started as soon as my eyes found your face. You ball spawned bitch. Swords were drawn in an instant, magic crackling between her palms and then that voice behind her. Not one step closer. It was Valigar, Imoen risking a glance back to see him stood in the alley behind her, bow drawn back and arrow knocked. The men did not seem to favor these suddenly more balanced odds, the leader hastily sheathing his weapon as his friends fumbled to do the same. All right, friend. No harm done. I am not your friend, leave here before I give you proof of it. Valigar did not lower his bow until their footsteps had faded, the man carefully releasing the tension and slipping the arrow back into the quiver at his hip, Imoen sending him a relieved half-smile. Thanks, but you didn't have to come to my rescue, you know, I could have handled them. The ranger snorted, already turned and heading back to the busy square. That is what I was afraid of, they are right, this city is on a knife's edge and the militia will need little excuse to imprison one of your reputation. Imoen sighed, everything he did seemed to be marred by some gruff remark that made it all mere obligation. Yeah, your sense of chivalry could use work, mate. Chivalrous or not? His argument is sound and I would there were more who would act so for your kind. And the pair world to find a woman stood on the terrace behind them and flanked by two guards, one a man covered in tattoos, the other a stern-looking half-orc. The woman herself was dressed in robes of blue and red, her face round and rosy, and Imoen placed her as nearing her thirtieth summer, auburn hair just visible at the temples of her dark blue wimple. Imoen frowned. And you are. The woman smiled benignly. I am Melison and you are Imoen, the pretty girl with the pink hair, Agwin told me you were looking for your companion, another of the children you believe could have come here. Yeah, definitely. Imoen cried, all eagerness, her name is Fritha, she's about so high, with all this ginger hair and brown eyes and... I am sorry. The woman cut in, but I have met no one like that. What made you believe she would be here? Imoen sighed heavily. Well, it's a bit of a long story, but basically, we went to this old elven ritual site looking for her and this woman, Ilisira, pitched up, also looking for her, though she seemed happy enough to try and kill us instead. Then when she died, the stone sort of woke up and talked about Sarah Dush, and so here we are. To be honest with you, I'm not sure Frith is here anymore. Melison was frowning. This woman, Ilisira, did she give you any reason for her attack? Valigar shook his head. No, she just said great things were afoot. And then threw her life away, added Imoen, why do you ask? I believe I have heard the name before offered the woman, and in none too pleasant tales. She is a ballspawn herself and one who hunts others of her kind for her own ends, but... The deep bellow of a horn somewhere above them cut her off. What is that? 
snapped Valigar, dark eyes scanning the walls where guards shouted and clamored. A glance between them and Imoan was off, Valigar at her heels as they dashed back along the alley and down the narrow lane, Imoan taking the steps two at a time. The guards were too busy to pay any mind to their arrival, Imoan's pace slowing as they closed to the battlements, her eyes fixed upon the dark sea that was moving steadily towards them. Is that... An army approaches? Bellowed a guard further down the wall, send out runners. Another bray of the horn. Imoan could make out figures in the swarm now, the flash of shields and armor broken here and there by the looming black of the siege towers and the lumbering forms of giants. But why are they coming here? Imoen cried. It was Melison who answered her, the woman's eyes never leaving the horizon. I believe I know, and if it is who I think it is, I must warn General Gromnir. And she was off, bounding down the steps, her guards racing after her. Imoen turning as she had to get a view of the entire eastern quarter, the market below frozen in a tableau of tense anticipation. Valigar's hand started her, heavy on her shoulder as he made to urge her before him. Come, we need to find the others, we can still get out of the city before they arrive. What? She cried, shaking him off, but what if Frith is here? You said yourself but a moment ago you do not believe she is. Yeah, well maybe I want to be sure now she might be killed. But their argument ended moot. A final bellow of that horn and from across the city they heard that deep plangent clang, the city gates were shut. End of chapter